Stoicism goes back to old Rome, so it makes sense that a lot of analysis and misguided judgments have developed about it throughout the long term. A few people will excuse Stoicism as just an extravagant method of saying, keep a solid upper lip. But the fact of the matter is more important and supportive than that. Stoicism has stayed mainstream reasoning for every one of these great many years since it offers a powerful system for the individuals who want the existence of righteousness and tranquility. This way of thinking organizes reason and rationale in offering approaches to explore troublesome social circumstances and to persistently settle on ethical choices. Maybe now, like never before, we are encircled by approaches to enjoy simple and unrewarding joys. So why not check in with the Stoics to perceive what exhortation they have on the best way to maintain a strategic distance from the entanglements of current life? Chapter 1, Stoicism offers probably the smartest option for joy. Nobody needs to carry on with a miserable life, correct? Individuals have been looking for the most ideal approaches to evade misery for an exceptionally lengthy time span. Furthermore, in doing as such, the absolute most splendid personalities in history have spent lifetimes asking themselves what causes misery and how we can dodge such things. While there have been progressing in psychotherapy and neuroscience, the way of thinking of Stoicism keeps on being a famous asset for individuals who are looking for a dependable arrangement of standards in their lives. Stoicism can be followed back to 300 BCE. Notwithstanding, one reason it's as yet pertinent today is that a large number of the standards in Stoicism can even now be found in current mental practices, as intellectual social treatment. For instance, one of the center fundamentals of Stoicism is tied in with figuring out how to zero in on the things that are heavily influenced by you. Frequently, our wellsprings of misery are identified with things that are totally out of our control. We hear hung up on the thoughts of others, stalling out in rush hour gridlock, terrible climate, diseases or vacillations in the economy. Imagine a scenario where we could figure out how to relinquish our cravings for objectives that are untrustworthy. Imagine a scenario in which our joy didn't rely upon things like cash and the assessments of others. Imagine a scenario where we could prepare ourselves so our bliss was just reliant on things that are totally in our control. This is one of the fundamental bits of knowledge of Stoicism. If this sounds engaging you. At that point how about we make it a stride further and rapidly separate a portion of the major Stoic standards. First off, there are three key regions to zero in on, morals, material science, and rationale, which are all interconnected. Morals are tied in with finding an ideal lifestyle choice. To do that, we ought to have a comprehension of material science, which, for this situation, alludes to seeing how nature and people work. Also. One of the principal things to think about individuals is that we have a limit with regards to reason and rationale, which will assume a focal part in taking care of issues and finding our optimal lifestyle. The entirety of this can be summarized by saying that Stoics accepts the way into a tranquil presence is to live as indicated naturally. So we shouldn't disparage the significance of understanding human instinct, which incorporates perceiving the basic propensities and inclinations that can disrupt the general flow of our prosperity. Chapter 2 the act of Stoicism is three crees, and it starts with the discipline of desire. In a handbook for new Stoics, the writers present 52 activities that are intended to control you from being an amateur to a serious understudy throughout the year. However, the creators additionally recommend nine activities that should give you enough of an impression to decide whether Stoicism is something you need to seek after further. These nine activities are isolated equally between three classes, the discipline of desire, the discipline of action, and the discipline of ascent. This cosmetics is known as the three restrained act of Stoicism. These orders are intended to improve your character and assist you with being the best individual you can be. Every one of the three orders is based on what is known as the division of control. It includes recognizing and isolating what is and isn't inside our control. What's more, if you're comfortable with the serenity prayer, at that point you're acquainted with this division. It goes, God, award me the peacefulness to acknowledge the things I can't change mental fortitude to change the things I can, and astuteness to know the distinction. Variations of this plant can be found in religions, for example, Buddhism and Christianity, just as methods of reasoning like Stoicism. Thus, the principal practice is tied in with acclimating yourself with what is and isn't in your control. Not many things are in our full oversight. One of the old Stoic creators whose work has made do throughout the years is Epictetus. He recommends only three things over which we have allowed control. They are thought, drive, and the will to dodge and to get. Presently, how about we investigate what Epictetus was alluding to because we have to represent interpretation and the way that the expressions of antiquated Stoics have changed over the long run.
Epictetus wasn't recommending that we can control which considerations enter our brain or which motivations happen. Or maybe, he was alluding to the decisions our considerations can convey and whether we choose to follow up on our driving forces. For instance, we can't control when a drive of yearning shows up. Yet, we can choose whether or not to stroll to the kitchen, and we can choose which nourishments to get and which food sources to dodge. In like manner, if our first idea after gathering somebody is, gracious, this individual is a nitwit, we can control whether we acknowledge or reject this idea. In this regard, we can take thought on Epictetus' rundown of things over which we have allowed control and supplant it with judgment. Chapter 3, While Focusing on What's in Your Control, Center Around the Character From numerous points of view, human instinct today isn't all that unexpected now in comparison to its return in 300 BCE. Huge numbers of our longings continue as before. Allurements like food, sex, liquor, medications, and betting keep on being at the base of enthusiastic longings that can hurt or even demolish lives. The discipline of desire is tied in with working up your will to dodge or control the longings that don't add to a great character. Eventually, one thing over which we do have unlimited authority is our character, since our character is the number of our choices and activities. We can control our desires, and we can settle on choices dependent on sound thinking and our arrangement of qualities and standards. Truly, there are regularly outside powers attempting to get us to do things that may not line up with those qualities, regardless of whether it's tireless promoting or the assessments of companions, family, or colleagues, at the end of the day the choice is our own to make. Along these lines, while the primary exercise is tied in with perceiving what is and isn't in your control, the subsequent exercise is tied in with moving your core interest. We should check whether we can quit agonizing over outside things that are out of our control and rather center around inner things similar to how we choose to utilize our time or how we react to the difficulties life tosses our direction. Consider it thusly, what amount of our lives are spent agonizing over results over which we have almost no control. At the point when you center around a character, you can place yourself in the situation of saying, I realize I gave a valiant effort. The result isn't in my control, however, I can decide to be cheerful in any case since I made every effort to impact a positive result. Think about your well-being. Among the things, Epictetus prompts us not to be disinclined to our infection, passing, and neediness because once more, we don't have complete command over these things. We can impact them by settling on choices that help long, sound life, in any case, we could wind up debilitated or pour through no deficiency of our own. Furthermore, since we can't control it, we shouldn't let it stress us. The equivalent can be said for that forthcoming presentation on it at work. Instead of hanging every one of your expectations and your satisfaction on the result, a stoic would just zero in on doing the best occupation she can. Chapter 4, Remember the Fleetingness of Life, Assets, and Conditions The last exercise in the discipline of desire manages a precarious subject, fleetingness. Odds are, where it counts, you know the truth, nothing keeps going forever. However, for huge numbers of us, this is something that we decide to disregard. For old-school Stoics like Epictetus and the Roman sovereign Marcus Aurelius, there was valid justification to remember the fleetingness of life. Just four of Aurelius' thirteen kids lived to adulthood, and during his rule, there was a horrendous plague that ended the lives of five million Romans. Thus, preparing yourself for the chance of a friend or family member passing appeared well and good. Pundits of Stoicism will regularly propose that its standards are intended to transform individuals into sullen, heartless robots who avoid joy. Be that as it may, this is taking an exceptionally restricted view. Ask yourself, which bodes well, denying the way that nothing keeps going forever or being ready for the inescapable. What Stoics truly esteem is serenity, which is different from a cool, insensitive, unfeeling disposition. Making progress toward composure is tied in with taking a stab at a specific degree of peacefulness or quiet practicality. What's more, who wouldn't need that? We should not overlook, fleetingness isn't just about existence and passing. Reason and rationale reveal to us that temporariness applies to almost everything throughout everyday life, including our things and conditions. A significant number of us get troubled when our PC separates, or the financial exchange takes a tumble. Be that as it may, possibly we shouldn't. Perhaps the more reasonable method of living is comprehended that such things will undoubtedly occur and that what's here today might be gone tomorrow. In addition to the fact that this is living as per nature, it can likewise prompt more thankfulness for the beneficial things throughout everyday life, which, thus, can prompt more joy. Then again, it can likewise prompt more strength notwithstanding troubles, since you realize that they won't keep going forever, all things considered.
With regards to the discipline of desire, dealing with temporariness is one of the additionally testing viewpoints. So start little and stir your way up to the more significant things. For example, whenever your vehicle stalls, take a stab at being stoic about it. The rationale should disclose to you that it will undoubtedly happen one day, so why worry about it? Rather than surrendering to dissatisfaction, offer gratitude for all the days when your vehicle got you where you expected to go. Chapter 5, The Discipline of Action Includes Setting Yourself Up for What's Probably Going to Occur We begin the discipline of action following the discipline of desire. While the primary order was tied in with figuring out how to zero in on the things you can control, the subsequent order is about the moves you make or don't take. This is about how we react to difficulty and the means we can take to make the best, most idealistic choices. The vital message here is, the discipline of action includes setting yourself up for what's probably going to occur. Indeed, the objective of Stoicism is to carry on with the existence of a prudent character. For a rehearsing Stoic, that implies carrying on with a day-to-day -day existence in agreement with nature. Also, congruity implies composure and not losing your temper or surrendering to outrage. Normally, this is quite difficult. Yet, likewise, with anything, it's about training, practice, practice. The way to this training is to understand your current circumstance. Keep in mind, the Stoics put a high incentive on being comfortable with human instinct. For this situation, it's knowing early the difficulties you can expect when going into a given circumstance. The model Epictetus gives is setting off to the Roman bathhouses. In case you will go washing, you shouldn't be shocked to discover a few people who are there to act absurd, scold others, and even to take. Such is the idea of your kindred people. The fact of the matter is to set yourself up for what is probably going to occur so that you're not found napping. This will diminish your odds of inadvertently losing your temper or in any case acting such that you may later lament. All things considered, if there's one thing we can dependably rely on, it's that individuals will perpetually carry on in ill-advised manners. Indeed, similarly, as we can set ourselves up for entering a troublesome circumstance, we can envision experiencing troublesome individuals regardless of where we get ourselves. As Emperor Marcus Aurelius once called attention to, a few people are egotistical, desirous, beguiling, vicious, and by and large planning something naughty. He even suggested letting yourself know, before anything else, that you will without a doubt experience a portion of these individuals today. From his perspective, it's absurd to be angry with such individuals or anticipate that they should act in any case. Individuals will be what their identity is, it's simply one more actuality of human instinct, and the Stoic must be in congruity with nature. Chapter 6, Journaling is a successful and imperative instrument in beginning your Stoic practice. The last exercise under the discipline of action is an activity that can profit each of the three controls. It's an activity that is suggested by numerous emotional well-being experts and by specialists who are attempting to enable their patients to improve night's rest. It's the basic demonstration of considering your day and recording a few considerations. One of the most significant of the old Stoic compositions is Marcus Aurelius' Meditations. Meditations is a proliferation of Marcus' diaries, and it shows exactly how significant the cycle was for helping Marcus recognize and stick to his ethics. Reflections are likewise a consoling book. We can see that Marcus is very much aware that he is an awesome, and that being a Stoic is a consistent work in progress. By routinely setting aside the effort to reflect and assess your battles and triumphs, you, like Marcus, can recognize zones and teaches that need consideration. Seneca, a Roman representative, and another vital figure in the antiquated Stoic convention, additionally supported the possibility of normal self-reflection by the day's end. As far as he might be concerned. It was a training that permitted him to rest adequately around evening time. Also, on the off chance that you've ever thrashed around in bed, incapable to quit replaying functions from before in the day, you ought to do likewise. Put aside at some point before subsiding into bed to think about the day, record your contemplations, and receive the benefits of a quiet psyche. The creators additionally prescribe journaling as an approach to fortify all parts of your stoic practice, particularly when you're simply beginning. Utilize your diary to consider the center rules that we've just addressed. For instance, recollect an ongoing troublesome experience and record a few parts of this experience that were in your control, and some that weren't. What would you be able to gain from this experience? How is it possible that you would better set yourself up next time, so it won't be as troublesome as in the past? Did you have any ridiculous desires that persuaded the individual you experienced would act with a specific goal in mind? Or on the other hand, Maybe there was an ongoing function that filled in as an excruciating token of the fleetingness of life? As should be obvious, by thinking about late functions, 
you can truly fortify your comprehension of the center standards of Stoicism. It's a significant device for zeroing in your energies on the things that are in your control, setting yourself up for experiencing testing situations and troublesome individuals. Chapter 7 The primary activities in the discipline of ascent include getting and countering starting impressions. Following the discipline of desire and the discipline of action, we begin the discipline of ascent, the most exceptional of Stoicism's three controls. Presently is a decent and ideal opportunity to review the three things that Epictetus accepted are in your unlimited oversight musings, motivations, and the will to dodge and to get. In the discipline of desire, we deal with our capacity to ace our will to dodge and to get. With the discipline of action, we chip away at controlling our motivations. In the discipline of ascent, it's our contemplations. What's more, recollect, in Stoicism, considerations basically allude to the snap decisions we make. While we can't prevent these from happening, we can figure out how to counter them with rationale, reason, and a craving to live more ethically. We as a whole realize that underlying impressions are regularly off base. How often have we made suppositions about individuals, just to be refuted once we became more acquainted with them better? How often have we feared setting off to a function, just to be agreeably shocked once we got there? The amazements we experience with individuals and functions aren't generally lovely. As the platitude goes, appearances can be deluding, so the training here is to focus on those moments when a critical idea springs up. As Epictetus recommends, Face each cruel impression with the words, you are nevertheless an impression, and not in the least what you appear to be. The creators suggest a similar practice. In case only you're, they even suggest saying these words out loud. Getting yourself like this ought to have the impact of keeping you from settling on helpless choices or automatic responses that you may live to lament. The fact is to turn out to be more smart and careful with regards to responding and deciding. So whenever you feel a quick judgment call going ahead, stop thoroughly consider it, and give yourself a second to chill off. To make this activity a stride further, don't simply get your decisions and advise yourself that they might not be right, question them. For what reason is this judgment springing up? What is the fundamental explanation behind it? As we'll find in the last section, this is a major advance in integrating all the controls. Chapter 8, The Last Exercise is tied in with disguising the standards of Stoicism and keeping them with you generally. Everybody loses their cool now and again. Indeed, even the most intense Stoics in history were open about their imperfections. So don't whip yourself if you choose to apply Stoic standards to your life and still find that outrage improves you sometimes. Stoicism isn't tied in with being great. It's tied in with gaining from your missteps and having an order set up that will take into account greater poise, more passionate soundness, smoothness, and possibly satisfaction. It's about not letting the chaotic part of interfacing with individuals improve you. At the point when you set up the entirety of this, Stoicism turns into a method of improving your character and turning into a more righteous individual. How might this improve my character? This is another inquiry you can pose to yourself when your underlying idea may disclose to you that this is something you either want or need to keep away from. The standards of Stoicism are particularly established in the possibility that we're every one of them a work in progress, and we have to have straightforward expressions and inquiries nearby that we can rehash and use to continually remind ourselves to settle on the correct choices. The more we practice and train ourselves to think, decide, and act in manners that improve our character and help us to turn out to be more temperate, the simpler it will turn into. This isn't only a foundation of Stoicism, this is likewise the primary rule behind intellectual conduct treatment. At the end of the day, there is a lot of logical proof that this way to deal with framing upright, character-building propensities works. In these parts, we've truly just started to expose what Stoicism is about. Yet, you can correctly put yourself by applying a portion of the standards we've covered here and put forth the cognizant attempt to disguise them. While daily self-reflection is an incredible device for doing this, another accommodating technique is a day-by-day -day contemplation. The standards of care contemplation are a lot lined up with those of Stoicism. Care reflection is intended to keep you zeroed in on the current second, and for Stoics, this is the main second we have authority over, so it is the focal point of their consideration too. The past is previously, and what's to come isn't something we have allowed authority over, yet the present is in every case loaded with occasions to develop yourself and the lives of people around you. Whenever you begin picking those open doors once again simple delights, you'll be following the way of the Stoic. A Handbook for New Stoics, How to Thrive in a World Out of Your Control, 52 Week-by-Week -week Lessons by Massimo Pigliucci Book Review Stoicism is an old way of thinking, however, it is one that remains exceptionally significant today. 
To comprehend the rudiments of Stoicism, you should realize that it depends on three principal thoughts, living in agreement with nature, understanding the division of control, and following a three-restrained practice. The training starts with the discipline of desire, which is tied in with understanding what is and isn't in our control, at that point, the discipline of action shows us how to explore troublesome social circumstances, and the discipline of assent is tied in with improving decisions and disguising the standards. Relinquish great and terrible. Was a week ago terrible? Is having loads of cash great? All things considered, neither of these assertions track. The main thing you ought to consider great and awful are things identified with your character. For the Stoics, just as Socrates, the main great is prudence, and the main awful is a bad habit. Thus, explanations like I carried on severely around him, or it's a smart thought for me to enable her, to bode well, however, proclamations like this apple is terrible, or a week ago was awful, don't bode well from a judicious point of view, because these aren't realities. The truth of the matter is an apple can't be positive or negative, it simply is the thing that it is. This may seem as though obsessing about semantics, yet it's more than that. The Stoics accepted we shouldn't allocate esteem decisions to things beyond our ability to do anything about it. At the point when you do that, you're setting up inclinations and doling out feelings and manners that can influence your dynamic and steer you away from prudence, which truly is terrible. 